Good day, everybody, wherever uh, wherever you are in, in the world. I'm not sure if it's morning, afternoon, or evening for all of you. It's really a, a, great, a great pleasure to be here with you today. And, uh, and I, I've been introduced already, uh, so I don't have to talk too much about who I am. Uh, but uh, I just want to say, perhaps in connection to the, to the chair that you see listed in my um, affiliation, uh, that, uh, that research chairs in, in South Africa operate as a research unit. So, so it's not just one person, it's a, it's a, it's a whole team. Um, and uh, as Rebecca introduced, it's, a, it's an international team uh, with three partners, including uh, ACTS and the University of Sussex in the UK. And, uh, and we are a team of people, including uh, about 12 PhD students, a number of postdocs, uh, emerging scholars, and uh, as well as senior researchers and, and visiting professors. Uh, from, from all over the world. So we are interested in, in, in exploring the way in which uh, innovation can be a driver of sustainable and inclusive uh, or equitable development in Africa. Uh, so uh, how can innovation be a route to achieving the SDGs? Uh, and we are particularly interested in the role that public policy plays in that, in that space. Um, uh, as has been mentioned, I, I'm also a member of, uh, of the advisory board of Africa Lakes and, uh, and I've been involved uh, with the network since its in, uh, inception. Um, uh, and I attended also one of the first, if not the first, um, Global X PhD academies uh, in the early 2000s, um, soon after Global X was, was first established. So attending the PhD academy. Um, uh, had a major impact in my understanding of the field, as well as shaping uh, my interest in future areas for, for, uh, for research. So obviously things happen differently to different people, but it's really my hope that you have the same, if not um, uh, a, a more positive experience uh, as I did with, with, with this academy. Um, so, uh, so with this introduction, let me um, move into my presentation. And I am aware that you've had a long day, uh, so uh, so uh, I will try and make it um, dynamic. Uh, I will try and uh, and leave enough room for us to discuss at the end uh, and and to make it interactive. Uh, however, I do have uh, some slides that I want to share with you um, uh, over the next uh, over the next uh, forty five minutes or so. So uh, so the point of, of my presentation is to give you an overview of the field of innovation and development uh, in Africa. It is quite a dispersed body of, uh, of work and literature, uh, and the innovation community in, uh, in the continent is quite young, um, young in terms of the length of its existence, um, uh, not so much in terms of the age of its members, uh, but despite it's, it's young age uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the community and the literature. Uh, it has been solidifying um, uh, over the years and Africa Leaks has been a very important um, a part of that community and has played a very important role in, in shaping the field uh, and the dynamics uh, in this space. So my presentation will uh, split into three parts. Uh, one of them, the first one would be an overview of the research on innovation in developing countries. Um, then I will talk a little bit about the origin of uh, innovation and development studies in Africa, and I'll conclude with a brief overview of the current status of the innovation and development literature uh, in, in the continent. Um, each one of these parts is informed by some ongoing work uh, that, 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 is, that, uh, that is, 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 is in, in, in the process, uh, and uh, I will try and refer to each one of those um, probably. So the first uh, very short part uh, is based on uh, an ongoing paper that I am developing with, uh, with uh, Rasmus Lima and Maria Rakas. Uh, and it's, it's, it's uh, forthcoming, it's, it's, uh, it's called Innovation in Developing Countries, examining two decades of research. Um, I want to use this, uh, this ongoing work as a way of situating the larger, uh, sorry, the, 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 the literature on innovation and development in Africa, which is the focus of this presentation as part of a larger uh, body of, uh, of work um, on innovation uh, in developing countries. So in this paper, and I will not go too much into detail about what we do in this paper, 
But uh, in this paper, we make a distinction between um, the literature on innovation and, and, and development and the literature uh, on innovation in developing countries. And I will try and, and, and flesh out a little bit what, what we mean by this difference. Uh, so our paper is focused on innovation in developing countries, which we argue is the largest set of, um, of literature that, uh, that comprises the narrower literature on innovation and development as a subset. So the idea um, uh, that innovation is, is, is at the heart of, of economic and social development is, 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 uh, is widely accepted. So um, I don't have to go into that, but, uh, but not long ago, uh, as I will come back later on when I talk about the, the literature in Africa, uh, innovation was seen as almost uh, exclusively a phenomenon that you, one would find in advanced um, economies. Uh, and developing countries would be mostly concerned about diffusion uh, of innovation and technological developments that would happen elsewhere um, and, uh, and, and, and acquiring those where possible. Uh, so this changed in the late uh, 90s or so. And the academic literature that was devoted to study um, innovation in developing countries has expanded rapidly uh, since, but it's not always been the case, as I will come back to. So we argue in this paper that this broader literature looking at innovation in developing countries um, uh, is quite broadly um, uh, 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 sort of drawing largely from the experience uh, of, uh, of, of northern countries or advanced economies and are applying that to understand innovation in lower, low and lower middle income countries. So, um, so this literature, as, as essentially as defined by the by the by the World Bank, as one would say, you know, in terms of income, um, this literature is quite broad and is is the top part of this slide, and it relies on a large uh, um, range of uh, disciplinary lenses or foundations, uh, from economics, management, environmental studies, industrial engineering, and so on, and has uh, quite a broad thematic uh, focus. Um, but as I mentioned, this systematic focus has been largely inspired by um, uh, experiences in, in more advanced economies. And then we have the narrower subset of innovation and development literature. And this literature is not only looking at sort of uh, uh, innovation activities happening in a particular place, which happens to be low and low and middle income countries, but it's looking at the role of innovation and technological change in um, in uh, creating and addressing various developmental problems in the process of structural transformation. So it would be present um, uh, or more pronounced perhaps in developing countries, but not exclusively. Uh, so uh, so it's, it's more relevant to the global South, but it doesn't have that specific focus on low and lower middle income countries. It's more about what role does innovation play in, develop in solving developmental um, uh, problems or sometimes creating them. Uh, so this literature has been um, grounded on the multidisciplinary fields of innovation studies and development studies, uh, mainly neo um uh, innovation studies, uh, STS and, and, and structuralist uh, development studies. And, uh, and as, a, as a result of this um, uh, disciplinary background, it's been focused mostly on innovation systems, firm level capabilities, institutions, um, uh, and so on. Um, and as I mentioned, this, this uh, literature on innovation and development can be seen almost as a subset of the larger you know, uh, literature looking at innovation happening in developing um, countries, but there are some differences. Um, I hope uh, this, this makes sense. Um, so as I mentioned, the, uh, the academic literature devoted to the study of innovation in developing countries um, has expanded rapidly. Uh, um, with to, along with an understanding that innovation is not something that happens exclusively in the context of advanced economies, but also um, uh, in the context of developing countries. Um, uh, and, uh, and it has um, uh, created a, not only a large body of literature, but also a whole academic community um, uh, uh, associated with, with innovation studies in this space. So we did, um, what we're busy with and the reference for this, for this work is uh, an ongoing paper, as I mentioned, uh, developed with some co-authors. And it's a systematic literature review 
um, uh, related to, to uh, of literature related to innovation um, uh, in developing countries over the past decades, as I said, and I will not present here all the results of this of this paper, um, but I just want to use it as a way of situating, of giving the bigger picture of, of the literature. Uh, the search resulted, as you can see in the bottom part of this slide, in a corpus of over 10,000 publications that constitute the basis for this analysis. Um, and uh, with this graph, uh, I just want to highlight uh, that uh, that there's been a rapid increase, uh, particularly over the last decade, um, on, on, on the literature and in innovation in developing countries, especially if you compare it to the previous decade. So if we look at the entire period between um, 2000 and, and 2019, uh, you see a sort of steady growth uh, over the first over the first half of that uh, of that period, between 2000 and 2009 or eight or so. Uh, and then you see sort of like a rapid change in year uh, and, and the, uh, um, the annual output uh, growing very, very rapidly from, from, uh, from um, 29 or so onwards. Actually, uh, in, in our study, we found that uh, nearly 90% of all, all publications over the last two decades were published in this second part, um, uh, in this second uh, decade. Uh, of the period that we that we are exploring in this paper, um, this analysis also shows us that the um, the literature is uh, very heavily biased uh, towards developing countries at higher income levels. Uh, so, if you look at the color uh, at the color uh, coding of of this graph, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to see very well, um, but uh, the yellow part uh, of the graph relates to upper middle income countries. Uh, and the bulk of the publications relates to um, literature uh, on, on, on upper middle income countries. This is your China's, your Brazil's, your India's, um, South Africa, Russia, so on. So the BRICS and, and, and some others. Um, and they really concentrate the, 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 the majority of, there is a critical mass, one can say, of literature on innovation in these in this, um, this upper middle income countries. And to some extent, um, the, the, uh, the sort of lower middle income countries uh, as well, and the literature in low income countries, which is the, um, the orange part of this graph, um, you can see that it remains embryonic, and and uh, the majority. This is this is where the majority of um, of the African literature in innovation would be situated. I thought it was important to show this because it gives. When we talk later about how rapidly the African literature has grown in terms of you know the the literature innovation and development. Um, we need to see it in the light of what has happened in the rest of uh, the developing regions and how the African literature still remains um, um, very small as compared to the, to the larger innovation literature in developing countries. Um, this figure uh, is also extracted from this work in progress. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, it shows that the literature innovation in developing countries is uh, spread um, across a broad array of uh, disciplines and specialities. And we look at the two periods again in this graph, um, 2000 to 2009, and then 2010 to 2019, that you will see in the two colors. Uh, so blue is the first period, orange being the second period. Um, and in both periods, you see subject, three subject, er, subject areas, management, uh, economics, and businesses, uh, uh, business, sorry, uh, taking the largest share of uh, the disciplinary background in this literature, uh, followed by environmental studies, environmental sciences, green and sustainable um, uh, science and technology. This is the current levels shown by the, by the um, orange uh, um, um, segments of this, of this, of this graph. Um, and uh, something else that you can see 
Uh, I mean, there are many things that one can read in this graph, but I don't want to spend uh, too much time in it, is that um, environmental and sustainability related fields, uh, such as environmental sciences and, and green and sustainable science and so on, have emerged as the dominant, uh, as a dominant group. Uh, and although you see management, economics and business is still being take, taking a very uh, a very um, uh, large share of the di disciplinary background of these studies, they have been generally uh, decreasing um, uh, in their weights. Um, something interesting here as well is the development studies um, uh, in the periods 2000 to 2009. The areas of uh, the, the development studies. Um, uh, um, had a relatively prominent presence um, in the initial period, but then it decreases uh, uh, in the second period. And this finding deserves uh, uh, further consideration, especially because development studies are centered in this sub-literature of innovation and development, as we will discuss later uh, as part of the, um, as we discuss the African literature and innovation and development. Um, let me move to the next part uh, of, um, of the presentation, the second part, which is talking about the uh, origins of innovation and development studies in Africa. And this is based on uh, some collaborative work uh, as well with, um, with, uh, with Rebecca Handling, Margaret uh, Holm Anderson, and Ankin Jiri, uh, which is looking at innovation and development studies in Africa. Um, um, and, uh, and I will talk a little bit, having given you a bit of an overview of, uh, of the innovation and, uh, in developing countries literature. Um, uh, I would like to now sort of take a gear and, and look back into the, the evolution of innovation and development literature in Africa and the perception of Africa's relationship with uh, technology and innovation. Um, have changed a lot uh, over the decades. And, and these perceptions are largely shaped by, um, by different theoretical lenses that have tried to explain the success and failure of different uh, developing regions, including Africa. And, uh, and the contributions to the literature, innovation and development have been very much shaped by uh, a changing understanding of what innovation is and what development means in the context of Africa. So I want to take us back to, uh, to dependency theory, which was very popular in the 1960s and 70s, um, that, uh, that consider, consider this idea of, of the core and the periphery. Um, obviously, the core being um, um, uh, mature economies uh, or more advanced economies and the periphery, which is uh, developing countries largely um, uh, uh, experiencing structural dependence through um, uh, colonization uh, and, uh, and, 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 and having a, a various sort of uh, difficulties in, in their development process that are shaped by, by um, these dependency relationships with the core. Uh, this literature, and I won't go too much into it, uh, was very much focused on uh, power relations uh, where African countries were very much seen as uh, producers of raw materials that they will then um, uh, uh, import, uh, export in exchange of, of manufactured goods. Uh, and from uh, using a technology and innovation lens, uh, the result of this uh, structural dependence was that African countries were seen as enabled to develop their own technological uh, base in terms of skills, knowledge, and infrastructure. And the focus of these studies were uh, very much on, you know, on, on diffusion, um, that uh, technologies that have been developed elsewhere, um, the cost and the feasibility and the appropriateness uh, of various technologies being uh, acquired by African countries uh, uh, for, for various purposes. Um, another implication was that African countries were trapped in this, uh, in terms of policy and lacked uh, policy autonomy to, to pursue different uh, alternative paths. And, uh, and as a reflection of, of, of that, um, uh, the whole literature uh, uh, largely disregarded this idea that local firms 
uh, need to be uh, uh, need to acquire capabilities or that the state needs to take any form of intervention because private sector and the state were assumed to be dysfunctional. Um, then um, the dependency theory came into criticism in the late 90s uh, onwards. Uh, and part of, uh, part of that story uh, of the reason why uh, it started to be heavily criticized, it was the experience from, uh, from uh, newly industrialized economies in Southeast Asia. Um, they showed, uh, the experience of, of, of countries in Southeast Asia showed that the periphery could actually uh, experience uh, uh, fast growth, not only by importing foreign technologies, but also building uh, indigenous, uh, um, uh, an indigenous uh, and dynamic industrial base. And uh, at the time, there were very critical contributions uh, to the literature that questioned the ways in which uh, um, technology affects development patterns in Africa, and also questioned the way in which these issues are treated in, in economic theory. And uh, I will highlight a few uh, of, of, of those uh, key contributions at the time. Um, uh, and I encourage you to have a look at them uh, if you can find them in the library. But uh, Frances Stewart uh, um, uh, in 1977, in her book on technology and development, look at various theoretical issues uh, and challenge the dependency theory, uh, presenting empirical data for, to, for some sectors in Kenya. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, then Martin Franzman in his edited volume, Technological Capability in the Third World, um, also challenged the assumption of, uh, of uh, local firms or developing countries having weak technological capabilities, and it looked at, uh, at, 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 at the processes in which these firms can master and assimilate important technologies uh, uh, through various case studies in the book. Then there were other books, uh, such as the, uh, uh, the ones mentioned down here by Francis Stewart, uh, uh, Lau, and Samuel Wang, uh, Wangwe, uh, that looked at uh, alternative development strategies in Sub Saharan Africa. And, uh, and possibilities for industrialization, such as that by Jadilian and, uh, and, and others um, in industrial development and policy in Africa in the 2000s. So these earlier works uh, highlighted the dynamic role of the state uh, uh, in promoting industrialization and technological change. And they put policy as the main explanatory factor uh, as to why some African countries are able to catch up um, uh, technologically while others uh, struggle to achieve uh, economic success. Um, and uh, they raised uh, very important questions for Africa. So how did East Asian uh, countries succeed? Can we replicate uh, the East Asian miracle? Was there only a single model? What was the role of the state? Uh, and, uh, and I will not go into this, but I just want to illustrate that the Southeast Asian experience triggered a range of studies that looked at at the variety of strategies. There was not one East Asian model. There were various alternative um, uh, development paths and different roles that the state and technology played in uh, activating uh, multiple stakeholder, stakeholders um, to, to, to reach uh, that success. Um, the book by uh, Alice Asdem, uh, Amsdem uh, in, in the year 2000, The Rise of the Rest, was a main contribution to the literature. Uh, synthesizing um, the challenges uh, that, that this late industrializing uh, economic experience in this process. If you haven't seen it or read it, uh, I strongly encourage you to, to look at it. Um, and I just, I have a little um, uh, uh, quote from this book uh, that talks about uh, the rise of the rest, which says, the rise of the rest was one of the phenomenal changes in the last half of the 20th century. For the first time in history, what was called backward, what, backward, backward countries, uh, I even struggle to use the term <laughs> currently, uh, industrialized uh, without proprietary innovations. Uh, they caught up in industries requiring uh, large amounts of uh, technological capabilities without initially having uh, advanced uh, technological capabilities of their own. Um, late industrialization was a case of pure learning, meaning a total initial dependence um, uh, on other on countries, commercialized technology to establish modern industries. So this work uh, summarizes a little bit this body of literature and work 
that was uh, drawing from the Southeast Asian um, uh, experience, emphasizing the importance of manufacturing and productive capabilities, um, uh, looking at, at how technological capabilities are accumulated, and especially uh, an emphasis on learning. Um, and I want to connect uh, this with the influence that uh, the literature on technological capabilities um, uh, has had in shaping the African innovation and development literature with authors such as uh, Martin Bell and Sanjay Lal um, exploring the cases of Thailand and India uh, at the initial stages to bring new lights um, uh, that, that then was taken up by, um, by African scholars and explore that uh, in more depth in the African continent. They, um, they referred not only to technological development at the frontier, but uh, these processes of absorption, mastering, and improvement of, of, uh, of existing technologies, acknowledging that there are very strong uh, tacit elements uh, in technology transfer, uh, that learning can be long uh, and, and, and costly and, uh, and, and it must be deliberate, uh, and, uh, and also that there is a, 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 a process of learning to learn, um, uh, which is a, a, a very interesting, a very interest, interesting concept um, that I also encourage you to, uh, to familiarize uh, yourselves more if you haven't looked at the work by uh, Martin Bell and Lal and others. Um, uh, um, uh, and there's no time to explore uh, in, this, in this presentation. Um, but it all is all part of the of the whole body of literature, international literature, largely drawing now on the experience of developing countries that had managed to accumulate, learn uh, over time, uh, um, technological capabilities, and use that as a main driver of um, innovation-driven uh, structural transformation. Um, the other, the other body of work that was going on internationally that also influenced the African literature in its origins uh, on innovation and development is obviously the, the concept of innovation systems. Um, and I will not go into very much detail, but uh, authors such as Christopher, Christopher Freeman, uh, Ben Toke Lundbal, and Richard Nelson are main contributors uh, uh, of this work. Uh, Freeman looking originally at the Japanese innovation system. Lundval relying on, on, uh, on the examples of Scandinavian economies, and then also uh, Nelson looking at the US, uh, but, but uh, other, other advanced economies as well. Um, this literature on innovation systems has expanded and evolved uh, as, as it's been applied uh, in the context of developing countries. Uh, and uh, some of these adaptations of the concept in the, in the context of developing countries have highlighted the importance of the locality, of power relations and inclusion. Um, and I'm sure you will um, uh, discuss quite a lot of this over the course of the academy. Um, I will not go into the definitions of innovation systems, uh, but I wanted to leave them here just to refer back to, to those uh, uh, key um, uh, authors that, that help initiate and, and develop um, the thinking around innovation systems, highlighting the importance of institutions, of interactions, of relationships um, uh, to determine uh, national in that, in, in that initial um, uh, discussion, national uh, performance in terms of innovation. Um, and the focus on, on, on learning and capabilities. Uh, let me move a little bit quicker because I want to make sure that I don't run out of time. Um, the innovation systems approach has some strengths and it has some weaknesses. Uh, it's good because it puts innovation and learning at the center uh, of the analysis uh, and it, it, it relies on evolutionary and historical principle, principles to, um, to, to make sense of, of, of uh, opportunities and current challenges. So the idea of equilibrium and optimality become irrelevant uh, in, in the context of the innovation systems uh, uh, approach. Um, it highlights interdependence and, and the role of institutions, as I mentioned, but it's, it's got some weaknesses. And, and, uh, and some of those are that uh, it not, it's not very clear what, uh, what actors and what interactions should be included and are, should be excluded from, from the innovations. 
system. For instance, some key um, uh, actors, uh, very relevant in the African context, such as informal firms uh, or informal institutions do not feature very uh, clearly in some of the original analysis uh, uh, utilizing an innovation systems uh, framework. Um, the concept of institutions sometimes is, uh, is, is hard to pinpoint and it has different meanings to different people. Are they organizations? Are they rules? Are they both? Uh, so sometimes the application of, of, um, of some of the concepts of the innovation systems uh, approach uh, results in disparities in how these, these, these concepts are, are utilized and, and interpreted. Um, and some may argue that it's hard to operationalize. So having multiple possibilities of intervention and multiple levels and multiple actors sort of complicates the design of, of, of concrete policies. Um, some colleagues in, the, in Latin America, uh, Judith Suits, Casolato and Lastres and so on, have highlighted that the innovation systems approach underestimates uh, the, con the conflict, looks at in interdependencies and interactions and so on, but it somehow uh, may underestimate the conflicts of uh, income and power uh, that are connected to the innovation process. And this has led uh, to, um, to the evolution uh, of the innovation systems perspective as applied in developing countries, looking at, uh, at localized innovation as a localized phenomenon, uh, paying attention to proximity, um, uh, shared history and culture and outlook uh, to, 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 uh, to give a better explanation on how actors relate, interact, learn and accumulate uh, capabilities over time. Um, this has led to very important work uh, developed by our colleagues in Brazil uh, on local innovation and production systems, uh, as I mentioned, paying attention to the territorial dimension, the locality, uh, which has uh, uh, develop the, the, the idea of the national innovation system further and made it more applicable uh, to the context of innovation uh, of developing countries, including Africa. Um, so um, taking all of this, um, um, uh, all of this view, the international literature, as I mentioned, on, on capabilities, learning, innovation systems, and the variations that have emerged from developing countries have informed, have been taken up by African scholars largely in the earlier 2000s, and, uh, and they have shaped the innovation and, and development literature as it is today. Um, and I want to, um, to uh, discuss uh, a few of those uh, contributions, because I believe that many of you will be using them and perhaps even um, having them as, uh, as, 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 as your, your lectures in, in, as part of this academy. Um, uh, earlier contributions by Banji, Oyelarano Yeyinka, um, uh, who explore the learning dynamics and, and, and the collaborative and competitive pressures ex uh, experienced by um, Nigerian clusters in this, this various, uh, these are some examples of um, readings that you may want to, to follow, but, uh, but there are many others, uh, many um, uh, sort of firsthand um, uh, evidence collected at the time. Uh, on Nigerian clusters, which didn't, which didn't exist. And his early work was um, pioneering because he, he shifted the discussion uh, in various very, very important um, uh, and profound ways. So he shifted the discussion from technology to innovation, uh, from the role of multinationals in African economic development to really looking at the dynamics uh, of uh, small, African firms, uh, in, the, in this case in clusters. Uh, it looked not only at, um, at the firm level, but also at other relevant actors, um, uh, such as business associations and others that played a very important role in, uh, in linking small African firms to global markets. Uh, in his earlier work, uh, also he highlighted the importance of context, of uh, social networks, of cultural dimensions, in facilitating um, information and, and knowledge flows. And these ideas uh, uh, constituted a very important pillar towards uh, the emergence of a very um, relevant part of the literature on innovation systems thinking in African development. Um, actually, in the, in the earlier 2000s, we see a, a very important shift in the assumption that Africa doesn't need to only catch up, but can also leapfrog. 
uh, and, and that's, that change in strategy requires uh, functional um, uh, innovation systems, not only uh, the inputs from science, but also dynamic productive systems, institutional capabilities, and well-planned um, uh, innovation policy. Um, uh, another key contribution uh, um, that, that, that followed was that by, uh, by uh, Muchi, uh, Gameltov and, and, and Lundvall uh, in the book of uh, Putting Africa First, The Making of African Innovation Systems. Um, it was published in, in the year 2003 and, uh, and it portrayed a new vision of, uh, of African development, a vision that is African driven, um, uh, breaking these all assumptions about Africa's role in global uh, geopolitics, and uh, and it very much had this idea of the Pan-African Renaissance uh, uh, based on integration, collaboration across countries, and um, and this idea of, uh, of, uh, of autonomy by utilizing the innovation systems approach uh, was exploring ways in which local knowledge can be mobilized uh, and contribute to building. Um, nation, national capabilities that will ultimately lead to a more unified and integrated um, Africa. Um, the application, and I will not be able to go through all of the important uh, uh, contributions uh, by scholars uh, in, in, in the earlier literature, but, uh, but I want to mention that a lot of the uh, um, uh, studies applying an innovation systems uh, framework in the context of Africa have resulted in these sort of sectoral uh, studies um, and very few theoretical contributions. This is a, this is a gap in, in, in the literature on innovation and development in Africa. Uh, and uh, and uh, I wanted to mention this exception uh, uh, on the concept of uh, emergent innovation systems um, by uh, Abdel Kader Jeflat. Um, who draws from the experience of North Africa uh, and argues that we need to develop a better framework uh, uh, that to capture uh, the case of those late industrializers uh, in Africa rather than those aiming to catch up. So in a way, his, uh, his contribution here uh, is very much a, a call for moving away from this narrative of catching up uh, uh, into another, another uh, discussion around uh, African development. Um, in my last uh, few minutes, uh, uh, I will go through the third part of the, of the presentation, uh, which is based on various reports uh, and, and exercises that have been developed by Africanics, uh, and also some of the, the work in progress, as I mentioned, um, uh, on looking at innovation and development studies in Africa. Um, so um, in my presentation so far, um, I, I have uh, uh, emphasized or also indicated that um, scholar preoccupations, uh, scholarly preoccupations uh, with, with Africa's development and the role that innovation plays in that process. Um, go back to the 1960s and the 1970s. Um, and in the earlier literature, um, innovation was seen as something that happened outside of Africa and, uh, and, uh, and, the, global, uh, and the global forces were shaping in a way uh, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the features of Africa's uh, economic development. Um, and uh, the literature, then we have the literature innovation systems that gain prominence with the work of Ben Toki and, and Chris Freeman and Richard Nelson in the 1990s and, uh, and the related literature and technological capabilities and, uh, and learning and so on based on, on, uh, on the experience from, from Southeast Asian countries. And African scholars picked that up in the, in the early 2000s and use it to explore avenues um, to build indigenous innovation capabilities, achieve technological self-reliance and, and, and economic uh, autonomy. So AfricaLeaks was conceived uh, uh, at this time uh, and, and formally established in, in 2012, uh, even though it was conceived in 2003, 
as a platform to sort of amplify the voices of scholars contributing to the African innovation systems literature. But it's worth noting uh, that uh, the broader, there's a broader literature, as I started uh, off with, uh, exploring innovation uh, uh, in Africa, sort of the equivalent of innovation in developing countries, but now focused in the, the developing region of Africa. Um, that is not necessarily reliant on the innovation systems approach. And that is, um, that is uh, marked in this, in this figure as the, uh, the, the second largest uh, uh, arrow uh, pointing down. So that is the body of literature uh, on innovation in Africa that doesn't necessarily rely on innovation, in, in innovation systems approach. And that has continued to evolve uh, with and without interacting um, uh, with, with Africa leaks. And, uh, and there is even more a broader literature on uh, African development uh, that contributes to exploring all aspects of uh, Africa's economic development, from policy concerns to structural economic uh, and developmental challenges, and the relationships uh, between Africa leaks, the broader literature on innovation in Africa, and the African development literature keep on evolving and 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 um, and, uh, and and uh, and strengthening uh, through various platforms such as the conferences and the gatherings uh, and and collaborations across scholars. Um, I wanted to illustrate this to to portray the literature on innovation and development in Africa which is what, what we are um, uh, going to be looking at in this PhD Academy, largely as part of a larger um, literature innovation in Africa and even a larger body of work on African development. And Africa Leaks has played a very important role um, uh, at various stages uh, in, in, as a, as a conven convening uh, platform uh, to bring in uh, scholars with different interests and in innovation, uh, also um, create a platform to, to make the interest of African scholars more visible, uh, and also shaping in a way the thematic orientation uh, of, of part of the community, particularly uh, the younger generation of scholars and, and emerging scholars involved in Africa League's uh, capacity building activities, uh, such as yourself. Um, and, uh, and this has uh, uh, also uh, uh, manifested in, a, in, a, in, in an evolution of a field in innovation and development that, that we are part of uh, as part of that journey. Um, so uh, very briefly, I want to uh, uh, present a, a couple of slides showing how innovation uh, studies in Africa look like uh, a few years ago and relating, uh, relating this a little bit to some of the exercises that Africa has Africa Leaks has done uh, in mapping uh, the, um, the field of uh, innovation and development in Africa, and also identifying the community contributing to, to, this, to this body of work. Um, for those that have participated in a, in a, in a recent uh, Africa Leaks uh, seminar, you may have seen some of these slides, um, but I thought they were relevant for those that haven't seen them. So, about 10, 15 years ago, the African community um, uh, looking at innovation and development was very small and very dispersed. There are very few organizations um, dedicated to the study of innovation in Africa. Um, there were very few events uh, 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 allowing African innovation scholars to interact. And uh, because of the, the large presence of external funding, uh, we saw quite a limited orientation in terms of addressing uh, the literature and innovation, addressing African problems, uh, uh, and, and looking at, at core development uh, issues uh, um, in the continent. So at that time, uh, as I mentioned, there were few scholarly contributions addressing innovation and development uh, uh, in Africa, and I've mentioned some of those uh, key contributions already. Uh, earlier in this presentation. Um, there, were, there was a, a, an early exercise uh, as, uh, as Africa Leaks uh, was launched uh, doing a pilot survey uh, uh, that uh, ran uh, in, in March 2012 and, uh, and identified and came, up, came back with 52 responses um, uh, and identified uh, 122 through those 52 responses it led to the identification of 122 African and international uh, organizations 
active in the field of innovation and development in the continent. And to have over, over 200 names of, um, of scholars contributing to this field. And uh, the researchers uh, identified at that time um, were working on, on various issues uh, uh, and, and those were uh, uh, analyzed in different ways, but some of the, the key areas that jump out uh, are systems, policy, um, uh, um, capabilities, learning, um, uh, and, uh, and so on. And innovation and development uh, was also um, uh, a preoccupation of the academic community about 10, 15 years ago. Um, just getting more detail on that, we, we were able to identify some key uh, research topics or areas of interest uh, that, uh, that give us a sense of what the academic community looking at innovation and development in Africa uh, was interested in. And you see several developmental um, uh, issues coming through, such as health, agriculture, climate change, um, uh, pollution, grassroots innovation, as well as some of the old topics, uh, adoption and appropriation of technologies, um, uh, technology transfer, and so on. Um, there were further efforts to map uh, the research capacity in this field in 2014 and 2016 um, through a couple of surveys uh, that were done. One, in, uh, uh, one led to uh, 263 responses, no, sorry, uh, 129 responses in, 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 uh, in uh, 2014 and 200, over 200 uh, in, in, in 2016. Um, and uh, without going into the details, which uh, the, the results of these reports you can find online if you're interested in, in, in looking at, at the figures and, and more detail about the themes um, and other aspects that, that were covered with these surveys. Uh, you can you can get a sense of the of, of the most frequently reported research themes, uh, which tells you a little bit about how the um, the community is focusing on and utilizing uh, the innovation systems uh, perspective to explore issues around agricultural systems, uh, the informal uh, sector, financial institutions, uh, the role of women in Africa's uh, innovation systems, um, low carbon energy systems, and so on. Um, and here uh, a, a, a little bit uh, in more detail, uh, which has uh, turned very much into um, the core of Africa League's thematic areas, which is now focusing on, on gender, the role of states has, in, has been informed by some of those issues um, uh, emerging from the, from the, 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 the mapping uh, of the academic literature that, that, uh, and, the, and the academic community uh, populating uh, the innovation and development uh, literature in, in, in Africa. So informal sector, natural resources, uh, issues around uh, um, uh, collaborations across developing regions, uh, and obviously low carbon uh, innovation uh, and, and climate change has, has been um, a core to, to African development. Um, let me stop there with a couple of final, final reflections uh, from my side, um, just to give you, to give a, a, a closure to this, to this uh, 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 overview that I've presented to you. So as final reflections, I want to, 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 uh, to give you these two messages. One of them is that the innovation and development research community in Africa is a uh, is, is very dynamic uh, and is very young, as I started saying. It's, uh, it's only picked up in the past, uh, let's say, 20 years. Uh, and it's currently been uh, a platform to approach and solve African problems and address African priorities, which has not always been the case. Um, and, uh, and yes, just with this thought, your, your work is essential uh, in shaping the future of innovation and development studies in the continent. And, uh, and I really hope that having a, a sense of the picture and how you locate uh, your own work uh, as part of the larger literature helps you, um, helps you uh, get a better sense of what your contribution is to, to, this, to this growing field. Let me stop here.